Welcome to Dreamland, a program dedicated to an examination of areas in the human experience not easily nor neatly put in a box. Things seen at the edge of vision, awakening a part of the mind as yet not mapped, and yet things every bit as real as the air we breathe but don't see. This is Dreamland. Good evening, everybody. This should be quite the program. As promised, we will have Robert Monroe of the Monroe Institute here. What an honor that is. Dr. Monroe, actually Robert Monroe, just Robert Monroe, coming up next, uh, he'll tell us about the Monroe Institute. Have you ever wondered about travel? Uh, not the type you take on a domestic airline, but the type you might take from your own body. Robert Monroe did. He'll tell you about it coming up. You're listening to Dreamland on the CBC Radio Network. I'm Art Bell. Well, good evening, everybody. The Monroe Institute travels from the body. The Monroe Institute was founded by Robert Monroe a former broadcasting executive who began to undergo spontaneous experiences in 1958 that drastically altered his life. Unpredictably and without willing it, Mr. Monroe found himself leaving his physical body via a second body to explore locales unbounded by conventional concepts of time and space. He has documented these experiences in Journeys Out of the Body, a Doubleday book, in 1971, published in eight languages worldwide, and in Far Journeys, Doubleday 1985. The Monroe Institute had its origins in the Research and Development Division of Interstate Industries Incorporated, which began investigating methods and techniques of accelerated learning in the late 1950s. That investigation led to some remarkable discoveries that dealt with the very nature of human consciousness. As a result, the basis of the research effort was expanded considerably. In 1971, the Institute was created to supplement that research effort. As a school, the Monroe Institute is composed of two divisions, and we will hear from spokesmen of both. The Education Division, which conducts classes and seminars and disseminates tapes and other materials in direct application of the methods it has developed. And the Research Division which conducts ongoing studies in enhancement of human consciousness and the development of methods and techniques that may result in practical use thereof. And that uh, is from uh, a Monroe Institute uh, pamphlet. And here all the way from Faber, Virginia, is Robert Monroe. Uh, Mr. Monroe, welcome to the program. It is an honor. Well, I'm glad to be here. Uh, Gia, do we have more than one person on the phone line here? Because it's very, uh, it's very weak. It's very weak. Very weak. Yes. Well, we can, uh, uh, we can take one out and see what happens. Okay, we're going to have to do that because I can't hear you. Uh, Is it better now. Uh, that's a little bit better. Uh, are you now the only uh, phone line on? No, I'm the only phone line on. Oh, that is much, much better. All right. Much better. Anyway, welcome. Uh, it sure is an honor to have you here, uh, Mr. Monroe. Well, uh, uh, I don't know what's gonna, going to happen after all that meteor stuff. <laughs> 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 yes, isn't that, uh, isn't that quite the occurrence? That was very, very interesting. Um, Mr. Monroe, um, if you would please take us all back and tell us how this began for you. Well, it, uh, it's uh, an odd thing because it was uh, unexpected is a better way to put it. Uh, back in uh, 1956, uh, my company was looking for some uh, uh, diversive type of things to do, so we uh, got the idea that perhaps we could in turn uh, uh, help people learn during sleep. So being a specialist in sound because of all of our, our company history, uh, we in turn obviously began to use sound. first thing we found out in order to help people to get to sleep was got to get them to sleep. So what we did was develop some particular sound waveforms that help people go easily into sleep, and then we were beginning to test that after that. Uh, I, being one of the chief subjects, uh, oh, uh, uh, that we started in '56, and then 
1958, I began to notice some odd effects of it. Oh. And uh, it was a funny kind of uh, vibration. And that's what it felt like, except it wasn't a physical vibra vibration. And uh, I went uh, to my favorite doctors and so on, and they said, oh, no, you're fine, don't worry. And uh, so I finally had the courage to wait to see what this, instead of forcing myself out of this vibration, I uh, finally said, well, if it's going to kill me, I'll let it kill me, and I'll have to try it. So I stayed with it, and after about five minutes, it faded out. And uh, so, therefore, I, I tolerated it when it went from, uh, and it didn't happen every night, maybe, oh, once or twice a week or something like that. So I had, I would wait till it completed, and then after it was through uh, or faded out, well, then I'd go to sleep. And on one fateful night in September of 58, uh, I was on a Friday night waiting uh, for this to fade away so that I could go to sleep calmly. And in the midst of that, I uh, began to think, well, tomorrow is Saturday, and being a uh, sailplane pilot and member of up in the New York area, uh, I was thinking that a cold front had come through and there'd be a nice, beautiful ridge lift and thermal the next day and on a Saturday, and I'd be flying around in gliders and sailplane. And as I was thinking how nice that would be in the, the uh, sense of soaring power that there is in a thermal in a glider, uh, all of a sudden I felt my, uh, myself bumping against something. And I looked around, and uh, to my surprise, I was... Uh, on some type of flat surface. And I said, I wonder what this is. This is a strange kind of dream. I'm fully conscious. <laughs> and uh, then I looked around and I thought, well, here is a, this is a, a strange thing to dream. Here's the thing that looks like a, a, a fountain coming out of the, out of the uh, floor, as it were. And then I suddenly, with a shock, realized that the, what I thought was the fountain was the chandelier in the, in the bedroom. Oh. So I turned with utter uh, astonishment and rolled over, and I, in that bumping against the ceiling, I looked down, and there in the um, bed below, there I was in the bed below, and there was my wife lying in bed beside me. Except that as the, I saw it at first, I didn't think that. I didn't recognize myself, because I, here I was bouncing against the ceiling. What was that? So... My first thought was, what a dream. I wonder who I'm dreaming is in my bed with my wife. <laughs> <laughs> and yes. uh, after a, a sudden little poster look, and I'm still against the ceiling, I realized this is the man in bed with my wife was I. So I frightened. I said, I'm dying. This is a dying process, and I'm mm -hmm. not ready to die yet. So I fought my way vigorously, swimming down through the air, as it were, and, and somehow popped back in my body. And I sat up and looked around, and there's my wife, soundly asleep. And I looked up, and there's the ceiling with a chandelier. Mm. And I obviously didn't get to sleep that night. <laughs> what an incredible experience. Now, you, you said that you were experimenting with some sounds uh, or some audio in order to assist you with sleep. Can you can you amplify on that? What were you doing? And was... Well, this was a... Um, a, a pattern that we had uh, we had developed but i hadn't i hadn't done anything with it for over a year and nobody else had uh had anything remotely like this particular effect okay so it was not due to that and whatever was occurring to you was utterly spontaneous it seems that way in other words I, we were looking for any types of uh of possible answers and that was when we thought well that would affect uh, 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 other people because we had about a hundred subjects that we had used in it but it didn't uh, affect anybody else anywhere, not even the semblance of it. Hmm. So anyway, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, the uh, most important thing was that uh, I was so sure that that uh, that that was a beginning of a dying process, and I was terrified. And you can't imagine how terror-stricken one can be or panic-stricken, because I uh, every time after going to doctor, I'm not finding uh, still any. Uh, interesting comment about it. Uh, I had great trouble of letting myself let that happen and let it and finding that 
if I released or just let go a little bit when that took place, I would float out of my body. And each time I thought I was dying. So anyway, uh, that went back into more physical exams, and uh, I finally got the courage to uh, go to a doctor, a psychiatrist friend in New York named Louis Wolberg. And uh, he said, well, uh, he says, I can tell you one thing. He says, I know that you, I know that you're sane. Uh, I know you too well. So don't worry about any psychotic thing because you're not that type. Well, I, I said, well, what do I do? He says, I says, I don't know. <laughs> you can go into psychiatry, take psychiatry and find it if you want. It might take a little while. but And, and I said, well, I'll think about it. So anyway, uh, after about... Ten additional episodes, something like that, I finally realized that this floating out and floating around the room was not going to kill me because I could think a certain way and I'd get back in my physical body. Until that moment, though, it must have been absolutely terrifying. It was, and, and I, could not, I couldn't get, uh, being very much an engineering type, I couldn't find any, uh, any common scientific answers for it. Uh, the only one was is, is uh, dualism, psychosis, and things like that. Mm -hmm. So that was the big problem because I couldn't find an appropriate answer. So uh, after about the tenth time, I finally realized, well, this is not going to kill me. I'm not in the death process. Well, that made something else come up entirely worse, and that's curiosity. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm sure it did, yes. Uh... It, it, it's not going to kill you. What is it? Anyway... Uh, so uh, I began to experiment with it uh, around the room and so on. And just I uh, could, I found I could only go a certain distance away from my physical body, and it was as if there were something holding me back. And I finally answered that because I realized what it was. And the other part of the life secrets, as it were, uh, I the thing that was holding me so heavily was that I had this very strong sensual sexual urge and uh, uh, I of course obviously tried to wake my wife and <laughs> <laughs> had no luck there and that that was binding you uh... it was keeping me close to my physical body because it was related to a, a physical drive anyway I used the uh, old Gene Autry principle on that finally and, and to, to overcome and my need to go beyond 30 feet from the body. And you probably don't know the genotry technique, do you? No, sir, I don't. No, you're, you're too young. Uh, genotry uh, had a, uh, a uh, thing where, in turn, he did a lot of... You know who I'm talking about. Oh, of course. Yeah, well, he, he had a formula that was very, very effective for... Uh, uh, pre puberty children who came to see his uh, movies on Saturday afternoon and in, in a movie house, no TV. To make it very short, what the, the technique was that uh, he in the movie he would meet a girl and then he, uh, he would have his big fight with the bad guy and he would overcome the bad guy and uh, after he overcame them he'd go to the girl, and she'd say, oh, Gene, you're so wonderful. She'd look up with pursed lips at him. And Gene would look down, and uh, all the audience, and he learned this, how, who can tell, through the years. But all the girls were going, ah, and all the boys would say, oh, he ain't going to kiss her, is he? <laughs> so what he did, learning that, he had a formula that fit his, his pictures, that what he did, he says, he said to the girl, "Honey, I love you, and I'll, I'll and I'll get to you later. But first, I want to sing you a song." And so he picked up his guitar and started singing, and they rode off into the sunset, and everybody was satisfied. So my answer, um, finally getting down to that, was there's an easy answer. Fine, I'll say to this sexual drive of mine, uh, "I'll get to you later." But first, I want to do this other. Yeah. And sure enough, it worked. So, you, in other words, you conquered it psychologically. That's and, right. And that released you. That's right. Then what? Then began a series of experiments, and and, uh, uh, and I uh, took this research team that I had and turned them loose in trying to find information about this. And uh, uh, we found that 
out quite quickly that there was uh, uh, what was an underground, as it were, and then we're talking back, back in the 50s or 59, 59, uh, which uh, was the area where all the, uh, you'd find the uh, uh, trans people and all types of, types of uh, mystical things and Sure. And uh, uh, call it Dreamland if you want. Or <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, uh, after a long uh, period of time, we found out the usual ones there, and I had a, uh, meetings with the. Uh, that was right at the beginnings of parapsychology, and uh, uh, I went down and met with J.B. Ryan, for example. I don't know if you know the name or not. No, sir. Well, he was the leading figure in parapsychology in that era. I'm not about 1960, I guess, 50, 59, 60. Anyway, to make it short, uh, I met with him, and uh, he said uh, on a Saturday at Duke University, and he was very, he says, it's very indeed very interesting, but he says, it's, it's not my department. And uh, I said, well, uh, uh, what is your department? He says, oh, we, uh, we work with cards. And I said, and I, I said, oh, thinking that I had a poker game the night before, <laughs> and uh, he explained how they were have subject testing subjects for uh, psychic ability by uh, having them read cards before they're turned over and this kind of thing. Oh yes, I'm familiar with that. Yeah. Anyway, uh, so I left, and uh, uh, as I was going out the door, this. Uh, research assistant and Dr. Ryan uh, opening the door to get me out. Says, Mr. Monroe, I says, what? He says, don't worry about it. I says, what? Why? He says, I do it too. <laughs> and that was the first person I ever heard who had ever done anything like it. And then, then following up that, uh, mind you now, the fear had faded away and was uh, trying to do something about it. It was another question. So I had another friend, a psychologist, a name uh, Foster Bradshaw, and I finally got the courage to talk to him about it. And he says, oh, that's nothing new. I says, well, I'm glad to hear that. And he says, uh, 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 there's a very easy way to handle it. And I says, what do you mean? He says, this oh, you go over to India. That's it. And you live with a, in an uh, ashram with a guru for about uh, some time, and he'll tell you all, he'll get it all fixed up in your mind. Uh-huh. And I said, well, thinking uh, about my business and my home and my wife and two children, and uh, I said, well, how long would this take? He says, well, that's not important how long it takes. Well, I said, how long do you think it's take? And he says, well, oh, maybe 10 to 15 to 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> and I had my usual run with him, and I said, well, Brad, uh, what would you do? And knowing, knowing he has a wife who had two grand pianos, and that's why he is an industrial psychologist in New York, uh, maintain things like that. I said, what would you do, Brad? He looked at me with his lofty, all lofty smile and says, it's not my problem, it's yours. <laughs> yeah, nice answer. <laughs> uh, how much experimentation had you begun to do with this? In other words, um, once you realized it wasn't going to kill you, as you continued to have these experiences... What did you try to do? Well, I, I tried the very simple things, obviously, at first, and that is uh, uh, going uh, through the walls in the house and out and around and, and stretching outward and going upward, obviously, in the uh, being a uh, pilot in airplanes that it was interesting to go up and go and play in the clouds. Uh. And see, because I no longer had the fear, but I gradually began to expand it, and my main key in the in the early era was to get stuff I could verify, uh, such as uh, go to some uh, person's house and, and visit with them and try to make uh, uh, make some kind of appearance or get information and bring it back. Were you able to do that? Very much so. And to my very pleasant surprise, as a matter of fact, and, uh, in several cases I appeared as a, a people perceived, not knowing that I was there. That's the point. I didn't announce it. Uh, I was going to go visit them that particular evening or whatever, but I appeared as, as sort of a, uh, a little bit of a swirling gray mist, and that's why they saw me, not as a physical person, wow. but as a gray mist. Wow. Anyway, uh, it's most important to recognize that 
it was fully a year of this type of experimentation before I myself was convinced of the reality of it. That 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 it was not an hallucination or a, a wild dreaming state or whatever. It took a full year of this before I said yes, this is real. Did you, uh, as time went on, were you more easily able to attain the state uh, where you would uh, be able to travel out of body? Oh yes, very much. That's what all of this was. And uh, 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 then I got uh, as as it, we moved into the early 60s on it, well, we began to do all different types of experimentation on uh, going to the coast and back and everything else. Huh. Oh, that's remarkable. Mr. Monroe, hold on just a moment. We'll be right back to you. We're interviewing Robert Monroe of the Monroe Institute. This is Dreamland. Mr. Monroe, if you are there, we are now right at the top of the hour. And so we're going to pause uh, for about five minutes and do the news and so forth and so on and, uh, and come right back. So uh, stay put, relax for a few minutes. We'll be right back to you, okay? Very good. All right, great. Uh, Mr. Monroe, Robert Monroe of the Monroe Institute, back in a moment as we talk about states of consciousness that, uh, that perhaps can be achieved by you, perhaps by everybody, if only they knew how to do it. Talk about uh, inexpensive travel. This is Dreamland. Well, we will continue with your calls or uh, and begin your calls shortly. My guest is Robert Monroe of the Monroe Institute, and he's been describing uh, a very early experience or a series of experiences he had with journeys out of the body. And this is um, really, I guess, the genesis of the Monroe Institute, internationally famed uh, for what it does. And uh, Mr. Monroe, are you there? Oh, I think I'm here anyway. Oh, you you are, although I suppose with you, one never knows for sure. No, they know for sure. I, that, I've gotten <laughs> past that now. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me, um, there's been a lot of uh, a scientific study and some not so scientific of the near death experience. Yes. And and you mentioned that you thought it might have been uh an NDE that you were having. Um is there a relationship uh to the NDE? Uh, not not in the sense that uh, it's commonly been researched in recent years. Uh, it, it, it's a different kind of thing. We were very methodical. Uh, you got to understand that uh, simultaneously with all of this uh I, in turn, was operating a company, and we moved out of the broadcasting uh, program production, and then instead of going to the West Coast, we moved down to where we had three radio stations down in Virginia and North Carolina, mm -hmm. and uh, we set up a facility here and began uh, a very serious research, and the first thing that we found out uh, was that uh, conventional science did not have any means of measuring anything like this at all. Right. The closest thing uh, was the uh, biological and electrical signs, and we got into those uh, relatively early. But in going down to Virginia, then we did uh, set up a research facility where we could indeed uh, see if it was possible to measure other people in similar states. And in the beginning of that, uh, uh, we enlisted a uh, uh, Ph.D. doctor, young friend, uh, who's been a friend ever since, back in the uh, back in the 60s. And we began some very serious experimentation. And uh, uh, a man by the name of Charlie Tart. I don't know whether you've heard of Charlie or not. No, sir. Were you able to actually document any biological changes that occurred during this state? Uh, we began to match them up, and we found uh, uh, that, generally speaking, uh, we uh, also developed methods and techniques, but uh, we had an average of about eight to ten subjects that we were using constantly in the 60s uh -huh. and 70s down in Virginia, in Richmond, and then in Charlottesville, incidentally. Uh, what brought us into Charlottesville is that we got into the cable business. Oh, yes. <laughs> so. Yes, I'm very familiar with it. I guess we've been down similar roads. My background is in uh, cable television and broadcasting. And, you know, uh, uh, even even then, uh, in the whole idea we were microwaving signals in, uh, I thought, aha, someday that's what uh, cable's going to be. It'll be satellite stuff. Anyway, 
uh, to make it short, that we there was no means of measuring other than the conventional signals, and we found one of the things there were two states that uh, came out biologically, and I be that I mean chemically and electrically. One of them was uh, uh, dreaming sleep, and that was when one was near the physical body. The second one was in stage four sleep, which is deep sleep, delta sleep, and that is when the major uh, uh, activity in what we we coined the phrase and it became generic. Uh, we didn't like to call it the old phrase of astral traveling because it had too much of a mystical flavor. Mm-hmm. So we uh, coined the term out of body, which has now become generic, as you know. But uh, what we found is that uh, that the, these extended distance type of of uh, activity all had to do with stage four sleep. And how, that, that how, was, uh, if, if I might, um, Mr. Monroe, how were you actually able to document that? If if a person is there sleeping. How do you correlate uh, the time of the out-of-body experience with a particular uh, state of sleep? Well, it was very simple. It was, it, in the 60s, it became a lot simpler than it might seem at first. Uh, uh, we took various types of uh, uh, body measurements, uh, electrical measurements, and, and uh, occasionally then we got into uh, EG, EG patterns, but we did not have the equipment at that time in, in, to be able to do it properly. Anyway... Uh, what we found is that when a person was in one stage of sleep, uh, they uh, are subjects who in turn became proficient, I might add, in uh, performing this out of body. Uh, they took, uh, we took readings on them in these activities that they were doing and matched them up with the uh, biological signs of these two different stages of sleep. And this is how, where we began to get the connection that uh, that led us to really where we are now. But uh, through those uh, those early periods, uh, the uh, we did some of it. Uh, uh, we did it at UVA, for example, back in the early days in the 60s, and that's where we at least got the beginnings of working on an EEG pattern. Uh, out of that, through the uh, we attracted attention uh, from. Uh, various uh, scientific people uh, as a result of uh, just simply word spreading that we were looking at something from a different point of view as against a a strictly mystical approach to it. How was the conventional scientific community um, uh, reacting uh, to your work then? Uh, They uh, reacted with a great deal of skepticism until uh, one uh, and more of them began to Experienced the thing through the system that we were slowly, painfully developing, and uh, we—it um, was kind of a thing that uh, working on a means of getting past the hard rocks that I had encountered. And yes. the first one, of course, is fear, and the second one is, is the reality of what it is. And it didn't take nearly so much uh, work to have people determine the reality. And we're not talking about. Uh, uh, college students, which are often the typical subjects. These are people that uh, one way or another had, had heard about what we were doing and became interested in it, like a physicist and psychologist at Al. And that was the beginning back in the 60s. And moving slowly through the 60s, we uh, developed means of inducing these various states and uh, in inducing those states, uh, we got it very simple. The first one was And we gave them labels so they would be impartial in terms of states of consciousness. And the first one is very simple. We called it mind awake and body asleep. And this is what we call focus 10. And uh, so we did establish these different types of uh, states of consciousness that we could induce by using these very particular sound patterns. And so by the 70s, we had a... uh, uh, We had... It had spread simply because the word would get out to among the scientific community and those who were curious or had something similar happen to them uh, were attracted to our work. All right. Uh, are these the sounds uh, that are now known as the hemi-sync tapes? The hemi-sync tapes. In other words, hemi-sync. 
Yes. Hemi as in hemisphere of the that's brain, right. I, I that's take That's right. It. And what, the, uh, the, what these patterns we did find was that uh, it's a special method that we didn't invent uh, what's called a binaural beat, but we did indeed use that as a system of a means of getting these low-frequency vibrational patterns into the brain. Uh, in other words, a binaural beat yes. uh, it puts, a, say, a 100 hertz signal in one ear, which you can hear, and a 104 hertz signal in the other ear, and the brain has to uh, synthesize that 4 hertz differential. That's what a binaural beat is. So you end up with a, uh, a 4 hertz uh, that the brain itself uh, hears? It would be, uh, the brain itself has to synthesize that by uh, that synchronization of the hemispheres. Because one signal is in one ear and the, uh, the other signal is in the opposite ear. And the net differential. Yes. And I said we didn't invent that. It's just the actual waveforms are the ones that uh, we put together. Okay, then is it the 4 hertz uh, signal that the brain hears that actually enables or, or assists in, a, in, in attaining the state you're talking about? Yeah, it's a combination. Uh, we uh, now use multiple combinations thereof. But uh, that's, uh, that's how we first began, by getting these very simple uh, combination patterns going. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, in terms of where that... Uh, got is a, quite an interesting story, but uh, I'll bring you up through the years to give you an idea of where we are now. We have a 20-channel EEG system and a, uh, an isolation booth where we have got a great deal of the RF out of it, and we use that in an awful lot of research. And uh, I'll turn you over to Skip Atwater and let him talk a little bit about research patterns that will help. All right. Uh, I, I would love that. Uh, right. and, and go right ahead. Uh, coming is Skip Atwater. And um, uh, Skip Atwater, um, are you there? Yes. Uh, Skip, um, what uh, what division uh, do you head up for, Mr. Monroe? This is at the this research here? division that you mentioned earlier in your introduction. Yes. Um, fascinating stuff that, that you folks are doing. Um what can you what can you tell us about the present state of your research? In other words, what all this has led to? Yes, the present day research has really been uh, due to the age of computers. All the work that Mr. Monroe had done over the two decades uh, prior to the invention of the computer world and analysis is now being validated. He has always been a man ahead of his time, as it were, and the notions he had about what were going on, what was going on, are now uh, being proven to be true by looking at the brainwave states through computerized electroencephalography, actually measuring uh, brain waves with a brain mapping system uh, that runs off a computer, not the charts and the squiggly lines that we've all seen on uh, drug commercials on TV and things like that, but uh, actual computerized analysis of the brainwave states. What uh, what are you actually able to chart? This is fascinating. What can you chart about the brain besides uh, electrical activity? Well, we can uh, see how the sound patterns originally invented by Mr. Monroe affect the change in the patterns of the brain, and those changes then have been identified over the years as being characteristic of states of consciousness. So you can actually see dissociative states of consciousness and transcendent states of consciousness as they're experienced by the people reflected in their brainwave states. Wow. Um, that's a, a significant, uh, significant accomplishment. Um, what, what if, 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 if somebody were there and uh, we were actually ob observing this underway, what, uh, how are you able to document this uh, using a computer? Uh, is it just that I'm, I'm totally lost? In other words, uh, getting a little bit technical with me, if you can, what exactly do you look at? What we do is watch an overall flowing pattern of brain waves. Um, the uh, brain waves are the result of electrical neuron firings in all levels of the brain and are reflected up on the scalp uh, as activity of the brain. Not all things 
that actually occur in the neocortex or that gray layer over the top of the brain. The brain is active electrically in regions down deep inside. So what you see as the pattern and activity on the top of the scalp where we put our electrodes is a result of all that activity in the brain. So it actually takes the computer to figure out all that information. Right. Uh, but that is, in essence, what an EEG does uh, as well, is it not? In what way does the point you've come to differ from an EEG? Well, this is uh, the state of the art of EEG work in terms of analysis. It's not just the squiggly line graphs. You can take and make a map of activity, a color topographic map, like you might see a weather map of the United States as the clouds pass over it and the weather fronts pass over it. You can see that same type of information passing over the scalp and over the surface of the brain. And by analyzing those changing patterns uh, based on known concepts of brain activity, you can see the state of consciousness change as people move, move through them in response to the hemisync system. All right. When somebody achieves this state and is, in fact, traveling as Mr. Monroe has, yeah. what changes are, do, you, do you document? People usually start out uh, with what we call the alpha state, where in the back of the head there is high amplitude alpha as they're just laying there resting before moving into this state. That pattern changes as they move into what the sleep researchers call stage four sleep and what the consciousness researchers, researchers would call a dissociative state of consciousness or dissociating from the physical awareness of the body. That results in a high amplitude delta frequency happening right on the top of the head. Wow. Um, all right. Um, that, that's that's quite incredible. And so, where do you go from here in your research? Uh, as you're you're going to, I'm sure, continue to try to document this. What what is ahead for the institute? Well, the uh, first task five years ago, when all this became a feasible thing to do to actually map the activity of the brain as it responded to the stimulus of the hemisync process was to uh, improve the tapes by measuring the population of people and then changing those patterns slightly and improving the process that Mr. Monroe had discovered some years previously. Uh -huh. uh, I, I want to ask you a question. Do we have uh, more than one telephone online now? Uh, right now there is, yes. Yes, uh, could we, I'm, I'm sorry to ask, uh, but, but would it be possible to have just one phone at a time online? It's uh, reducing the audio too far. All right, hold on and I'll get off. And, and, uh, well, by all means, come back. I'll come back. <laughs> all right. Is that a little better now? That's, that's quite a bit better, yes, thank all you. All right. Um, um, the situation has kind of progressed from there, and now we are able to uh, record the brain waves of people who have specific talents, talents like Mr. Monroe's for traveling out of his body. But included in that are other human talents like a concert pianist or an architect or a noted author or computer programmer. And by mapping the patterns of those, we are trying to develop sounds that might be able to pass these talents on to other people. Wow. Wow. Uh, now, that's quite a line of research uh, to be following. How are you able to, and uh, I, I'm really uh, wandering around here because I don't know what I'm, I'm, I'm really don't know what I'm talking about. I'm, I'm, so excuse the ignorance, but how are you able to map, for example, uh, somebody with a great computer talent or somebody uh, who's a concert pianist, and what differences are you able to note between that in individual and anybody else? Yes, that's uh, ongoing research. What we try to get them to do is to perform their talent while being uh, mapped, while being recorded. We would record a, a baseline recording when they're not performing their particular art right. and then make a recording while they're performing their art. And if we can get 5, 6, 12 pianists, that can play the piano just exquisitely, and we notice a commonality between that pattern that differs from the general population while they do that, then we have identified a specific state of consciousness that would enhance being a concert theme. And you have documented this? In some talents, yes. It's hard to uh, collect data 
on all these things. But there are some talents that we have been able to identify. And are you able to see a uh, similar uh, activity in a specific part of the brain with regard to a very talented person, or does it vary uh, according to what the talent is? Uh, both according to the talent and according to the person. This is a, the brain, uh, each one of our brains is not identical. They are anatomically different. As we grow from infancy through adulthood, the folds and creases and changes in our brain are all different. Fortunately, there are some common patterns, and it's ferreting out those co common patterns over hundreds and hundreds of subjects that is our task. Wow, uh, that's quite a task you've uh, you've undertaken. And I suppose when we get to the practical applications, we get into the educational division. Is that correct? That's correct. All right. Uh, I would like to ask that you hold on just one moment. We'll come right back to you, and we are interviewing actually a number of individuals from the uh, Monroe Institute. We'll be right back. All right. And once again, F. Holmes Atwater, who is a researcher for the Monroe Institute, uh, and are you there? Yes, I'm still here. Good. Um, I, we've got a couple, only a couple of moments before the bottom of the hour. Yeah. Um, but how much of your research now um, is able to be translated uh, into educational help for people who, who want to know more about this? In other words, how much of what you have done has become practical application? Yes, there are, uh, that's a really good question and, uh, because we want to be of uh, practical use to people to do research or to do work in this area and never develop any practical application would just be fruitless. And we have developed a lot of practical applications over the years that have proven now over three decades to be of benefit to people. Um, we have a number of uh, brochures and literature about the use of our techniques in, with professional people, um, dentists, lawyers, therapists, educators who use the Hemisync technique in their own profession as well as individuals on their own personal voyages through consciousness who um, look into this technique for themselves to see if this works for themselves. So, in other words, there is help for, uh, there's certainly help for individuals. Is it in the area of, uh, well, I'll tell you what, we're at the bottom of the hour. Uh, let's hold up just a moment. We'll come right back to you. And uh, this, of course, is Dreamland on the CBC Radio Network. Journeys out of the body. Uh, we're discussing them, and uh, what practical implications knowledge of these things might have for all of us. We'll be back. Everybody, welcome back. I am Art Bell. We're interviewing uh, Robert Monroe of the Monroe Institute and company, most recently F. Holmes Atwater, who heads the research division at the uh, Monroe Institute. And uh, back now to the group. Hello there. Hello. Hi, is this uh, still David? Uh, would you like to talk to Robert again for just a minute? Uh, sure, go ahead and put him on. Thank you, David. Art? Yes, sir. Um, I, uh, I wanted to get our placement uh, very accurate. Uh, we were very covert up until uh, 1969, 70. Uh, simply for the reason that I was operating very conventional businesses, and uh, uh, I was very concerned when Journeys Out of the Body I agreed to it, simply because I thought, oh, uh, this will affect uh, my stockholders and so on in my company. Yes, of course. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, <laughs> and they didn't read those kind of books. <laughs> <laughs> so there, really, there, there was not a problem then? Not a problem. It was very interesting, and uh, but what? And so we were still very private, as it were, in our work that we were doing, up until uh, the mid '70s, when Eslin. I don't know if you know about Eslin. Uh, I do. Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, heard about our work and invited us to conduct a workshop up at um, Big Sur, and uh, we thought, oh, this will give us a whole bunch of new uh, subjects to test with the material that we have. So. We agreed to it, and, uh, and we went up and did a uh, work workshop, and they immediately invited us to go to San Francisco and do another one the next weekend. 
And we had never thought of doing anything like that. So we originally said, oh, we've got to give this a name. So we called it the M5000 program. M5000. <laughs> the reason that if we had 5,000 different subjects that we could test, we would have a wonderful base for data. Of course. Well, it didn't work quite like that, but it, uh, what happened was that uh, we began to get calls from other people as a result of that uh, about other programs, uh, doing this program over in other ways in other places. And I'll uh, turn you now over to Dave Balvey, and he'll let you, he'll tell you exactly what happened, all right? All right, wonderful, thank Hold you. Hold on. Uh, Dave Mulvey coming up, he is, uh, he heads the educational portion of the uh, Monroe Institute. Well, not head exactly, but I am one of the uh, trainers for the educational programs at the Institute. Fine, David. Yeah. Um, and now you take the, the science, uh, and you, you apply it. Um, that, how do you do that? Well, that, that's correct. We have uh, four basic programs. and Well, one is a, is a basic introductory program for people, and then we have three graduate programs. And we use this hemisync technology to give people a set of mental tools. There's a understandable conception, perhaps a misconception out there oftentimes, that the programs are about the out-of-body experience. That's what Mr. Monroe is so well noted for. However, the programs are much more uh, detailed than that and much more about a personal exploration of oneself. All right. Uh, why, why might I come to you? What trouble might I have uh, or, or, or um, a symptom might I have that I might want to explore or um, help with, with, with all of you? Okay. Um, generally, I wouldn't say that people come necessarily with uh, problems or symptoms, but more of a curiosity a sense of wanting to know more about themselves, about their relationship to uh, life and the physical side of themselves. And, of course, many people have a, at least an understanding or a glimmer of the non-physical side of themselves. So it's the curious who come here to find out more about who they are. And uh, what we like to do is give them these tools that then they can take out and apply, not only in terms of exploration of consciousness, but also in terms of day-to-day -day practical tools that they can use to enhance their memory, to keep focused uh, in a business meeting, for example, or uh, to uh, tap into a greater problem part of themselves for creative problem solving. So concentration um, exercises. Yes. Um, Using the hemisync signals to help people get into specific brainwave states so that they can then learn to uh, implant certain types of tools or encodings that they can then take out into their day-to-day -day lives. How well does it work? I, it works very well, and it's, uh, that's based primarily on people's subjective reports, mind you. We do get uh, a lot of feedback from participants who come to the program, and we get letters and uh, calls back of people who talk about how these tools enhance their lives in, in all kinds of ways, and sometimes ways that they might not uh, be prepared for. <laughs> Well, do people come to you for a weekend or a week or a month, or how does that work? Yes. Uh, most of our programs here in Virginia, all of our programs here in Virginia, are five-day to five-and-a-half-day residential programs where they come and they are here immersed in the process. We also do weekend workshops. We've just started doing this, weekend workshops out at various places around the country. We've done several in Chicago, uh, had a couple take place in California, have one coming up in August in California. Okay. Uh, and if I might, uh, could I give our phone number for people who might be interested in getting some more information about the program? Of more course. Detailed information? Yes, of course. Okay, uh, our phone number here is uh, area code 804, number 361-1252. And we have people standing by even now, and also uh, there is a, a message machine if they call after office hours. So if people are interested in getting some more literature about the programs, about the institute, we would certainly welcome their call. Wonderful. Wonderful. Um, all right. Well, I hope you get a lot of calls. Um, again, this would be, uh, these would be people who would like to explore more of their inner self. Um, is that about right? Uh, more of their inner self or physical self or both? Uh, it's both. We also, have, uh, we also have plenty of tape exercises, cassette tapes, that people can listen to at home in addition to the programs that we have. So that's the outreach of our educational division. Uh, and some of the physically related tape exercises are a part of a whole series that we call Human Plus, or H-Plus for short. 
All right. Um, I had a, a somebody in Cresswell, Oregon, who had a question uh, for Mr. Monroe, but maybe, you, maybe you'd be the one to answer it, though. All right. Uh, it is this. Um, why the Focus 21 on up hemi-sync tapes uh, are not offered for sale in your catalog? Okay, that, that's a good question and a frequently asked question. Uh, just to familiarize your listeners who might not be familiar with the various Focus states, if I could, I'd do a quick review that in our programs we start... Uh, Mr. Monroe already mentioned the Focus 10, which is a, a basic state we call mind awake, body asleep. Beyond that, we have a Focus 12, which is a state of expanded awareness. Once someone has learned to detune the physical senses, yet maintain consciousness, then they can start expanding and experiencing uh, beyond those physical senses. We have another Focus level called 15, which is a state of no time, is the label we use for that. And then Focus 21, which your caller referred to, uh, we call a bridge to other energy systems, to other non-physical realms where people can perhaps visit or gather information or get in touch with uh, larger parts of themselves or perhaps some people consider them uh, things outside themselves. The question was, why are those tapes not, the advanced tapes, not available to the general public? That's right. Yes. And um, we, we have several reasons for that. One of them is that we really feel like that these higher focus levels, these powerful focus levels, that it's most appropriate that people listen to them in the context of programs that we offer with uh, the support of a training staff. Um, it's not that we feel that people might have bad experiences, but they might have very powerful experiences that it would be helpful for them to have some uh, counseling. counseling or uh, the possibility to help them integrate these uh, you know, very powerful experiences. All right. Is there anything dangerous uh, about achieving any of these states, um, specifically dangerous? No, nothing, nothing at all specifically dangerous about it. We just feel that it's appropriate for them to have uh, you know, preparation and an understanding of what they're uh, likely to experience in these sorts of states so that they uh, are prepared for the sort of uh, things they might encounter. How do the states that you help people achieve differ in any way from traditional meditation techniques? I'm not sure necessarily, Art, that they do. Um, what we have attempted to do is to give them very neutral labels, like Focus 10, Focus 12, Focus 15, and we pick those numbers specifically to be to have no kind of loading on them, you know, like no lucky sevens or thirteens or anything. Sure. But numbers that would be as neutral as possible, so that no matter what discipline someone comes from, be it Zen meditation or uh, some form of, of uh, Hinduism or yoga or whatever, that they could work within their own system and yet use this hemisync technology to, to augment their inner journey. So then, David, is it uh, the case that one might take several different uh, roads to get to the same destination? Absolutely. And uh, one of the things that I feel really strongly about, and one of the reasons I'm very comfortable in working with the process here is that it is that kind of neutral process where we've literally had uh, people from all walks of life, uh, doctors, lawyers, engineers, scientists, uh, we've had priests, we've had nuns, we've had uh, swamis and rabbis and even uh, one fundamentalist minister <laughs> who have come through the program and felt that there is nothing within this process that has to conflict with their belief system. That's right. not to say that they might not have experiences that give them something to think about, <laughs> but uh, we don't uh, say that we have the answers. What we feel like we're doing are providing people the tools so that they can develop their own answers. All right. Uh, wonderful. Uh, if you would put Mr. Monroe back, uh, we'll go through some questions, and I'm sure we'll have you uh, back on as the questions come up. Excellent. All right. Uh, Mr. Monroe is coming back on in just a moment. All right. I will take this moment to do a quick break. We'll be right back. And when we come back, once again, Robert Monroe. Back to it we are. And uh, Robert Monroe, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Wonderful. I've got a couple of questions before we open the phone lines. Yes, indeed. All right. Uh, in your latest book, Ultimate Journey, yeah. you, you discuss the park, a place where people are sometimes taken after they die to acclimate to their new state, decide their next move. How could one go about reaching the park on their own, either out of body or after death? Well, let me give you a, I'll make it short as, as much as I can. All right. Uh, uh, our pattern has been odd, but it's uh, standard. We're a need among the people who know us 
uh, arises, we have we uh, produce something that is effective. We have, for example, an emergency treatment uh, thing that's used in hospitals uh, during surgery. Tremendously effective, and right at the present time, a major study is being done at the University of California at Davis regarding that particular thing that's been so effective for the last five years, and finally it's going to get an official report on it. Uh, that's one of the things. We have one for stroke recovery, for example, that is, uh, and it's only because if a person needs it mm-hmm. do we have it. Mm-hmm. Uh, then uh, this uh, pattern in ultimate journey, have you, you, you read it? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, well, good. Then I don't have to go into great detail, but for the public a little bit. Right. Uh, uh, one of the things that we had neglected was that uh, we had happily, because we were operating so heavily in areas beyond physical life, uh, we uh, did not get to the issue of death itself particularly. And uh, uh, so what happened very simply is that as in so many cases, in my own case, uh, the need outweighs anything else. And uh, three years ago, uh, uh, my wife, Nancy, uh, contracted breast cancer. And as a result, uh, I, in my typical demand way, said, well, let's let's provide a system whereby uh, I can... Uh, be sure that she goes to a place if she passes on and dies that I would be able to find her and be with her. Item came out then that uh, uh, I had, as you read in the book, I discovered that all the way back in the 60s I had been uh, escorted to a place called the park which is a way station uh, for people after they've died so they can cool off from the uh, trauma, as it were, of Mm -hmm. dying Yes. and figure out what they want to do next. Yes. Anyway, from that and researching that, and also with the areas of people who I knew had already died, we set up a program uh, called Lifeline, which Dave may have described to you, but which in essence is one to, to in turn, help uh, 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 get totally familiar with the process of moving from Focus 23, which is right after physical death, up to what we call Focus 27, which is this park. We didn't invent the park. It's been there for millennia, I found out to my great surprise. But anyway, uh, we've had, we as of now, we've had three years, roughly 400 people have uh, participated in this particular program, and they have made, uh, during the program only and during the program, each of those, 400 people have made five runs retrieving someone out of Focus 23 who was bewildered in shock and escorting them up to this way station park where they can cool off. Each of them have done it five times. How many does that make of those documented runs? is is a total of 2,000. Wow. (laughs) Big stuff. Big stuff. Yes, sir. uh, And they do in turn, and there is a... We have a postgraduate study on that going where we are verifying the, the data of the person who, who had just died and uh, try to get the try to get information that can be verified. It's quite difficult because it's out of time. If you understand what I mean, I do. Somebody has been wandering around in 23 and not, not knowing what to do and bewildered for maybe a hundred years. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, uh, that leads me to this. You discuss the concept of time being a physical, earthly phenomenon, uh, yes, that's right. a- accepted as a condition of entry. I, I gather this, uh, uh, that lives, times, and events are happening simultaneously. This is a very confusing concept. It is, it is indeed. And it was, uh, it's very, very surprising how uh, uh, we are locked into certain things that are peculiar to time and space. <laughs> and time is one of the key ones. And when you get up into these other states of being, uh, you got to re- realize that time is not, you can you can go backwards or go forwards. And uh, uh, this, in your own personal life and in other lives, you are locked into, uh, we think, uh, 1994, but it isn't so. <laughs> but it is not so. It is not so. What do you think of lucid dreaming as a springboard to having an OBE? And also, where do dreams fit into the picture? Do they? 
Well, I'll, I'll, I'll pose the real thing that's getting more and more our theme, and that is that uh, uh, lucid dreaming is the equivalent we found out over the years. We did that a long time ago. Uh, is the equivalent to our focus 15. Lucid dreamer can uh, evaporate the dream, and there he is. Hmm. In, and the, he's in the equivalent of our focus 15, which is uh, a nice place to play in terms of no time because you can then move that time around in other areas. How does do dream thing? The one thing that we've come... Uh, we are, we call it a process of converting unknowns into knowns, or converting beliefs into knowns. And that they are not particularly important unless you can do so. Well, uh, one of the things is that, um, <clears throat> well, <clears throat> excuse me, um, All right. the important uh, thing is that we have grown to know that what we are is far more than this one single life. And the, uh, we are totally in a form of consciousness that is very uh, local, as it were. <laughs> and the <laughs> dreams that uh, are, are interpreted as this are the a means of our total self uh, attempting to get signals down to this conscious self here. And that's why uh, uh, they sometimes are very wild, and sometimes they're very funny, and sometimes they're just pure information. But uh, uh, that seems to be that the direction that we feel that humankind has to go is to begin to get past this discriminator circuit, and that's what we we are doing, and get into that knowledge of that totality of what we are, and uh, that. It's being done. We're not the only people doing it, of course. Mr. Monroe, you've done very important work. It's known internationally. Uh, I want to ask you a hard question. All right. When your time comes and you pass, what uh, what will happen to the Monroe Institute, and will the work continue? Uh, that is very specifically, uh, uh, in uh, has been set up to do uh, to do that. There's much too many uh, people involved in it. Uh, not just here, but as you said, worldwide. I, I can give you a number of illustrations, but uh, it is being set up so that it will it will have a support system uh, to continue uh, well into the uh, into the 21st century. Well, that's wonderful to hear, and uh, I know a lot of people have wondered about it. Uh, mm -hmm. If we could, Mr. Monroe, very quickly, let's try and begin to take a couple of calls here. On our toll-free yeah. toll line, you're on the air with Robert Monroe. Mm -hmm. Hello. Hello. Yes, sir. Where are you calling from? Seattle, Washington. Okay. Do you have a question? We don't have a lot of time here for you. Yes, I do. I would like to know where Mr. Monroe first learned about this technology. Okay. Um, we've kind of covered that. Uh, uh, I would say, but Mr. Monroe, a quick answer? Quick answer. Where I learned about it, I found about it the hard way. Uh, uh, the, I, I'm the monkey that fell out of the tree, if you want to put it that way. <laughs> and I had to figure a way to get back up into the tree. And so really, um, through a personal uh, uh, experience that began some uh, uh, all by itself, uh, you set out on a quest to learn what was happening to you. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Out of necessity, as a matter of fact. And I, I, uh, the, one of the most surprising things that has it come up, has indeed come up in recent years, uh, that back in those early days, I had an exquisite amount of help. And uh, even today, I cannot assure anyone exactly where that help came from. One has to wonder, Mr. Monroe, how many people uh, worldwide are going through exactly what you went through, perhaps without the support system uh, that, that you luckily had nearby? Mr. Monroe, we're going to break here for the news at the top of the hour and come back and open up the phone lines. How's All that? Right. Very All right. Good. Very good. Robert Monroe from the Monroe Institute, a very unique opportunity uh, to talk with a, uh, a researcher who has been there. We'll be back. On a Sunday evening, uh, particularly appropriate, I think, this evening, the name of our program derived from its physical adjacency to that area known as Dreamland. 
But with uh, dual application in the interview of Robert Monroe, who doesn't give that many interviews, it is a great pleasure, and we are going to get phone lines open uh, this hour and uh, let you ask quite a, quite a few more questions. Uh, in, that, uh, in that hope, let me go ahead and take care of a little commercial obligation right now, and in just a moment, Robert Monroe. Once again, Robert Monroe. Mr. Monroe? Yes. Uh, yes, sir. Um, again, it sure is a pleasure to have you on here. Well, it's fun for me because I can um, uh, open up a lot of things and uh, don't have to be nearly so formal. But remember, radio is my old business. Oh, it's a wonder. I, I love radio. Um, Mr. Monroe, um, somebody just sent me a fax, and they're asking about two things. One, in your travels, um, um, have you... Do you have any insight on two questions? One is, have you ever met with a being or met a being that is not human? And oh, that... yes, I have. <laughs> oh, yes, you have? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and let's put it this way. It is indeed limited. But uh, the thing that I discovered not unreasonably is that uh, we are a curiosity to other beings. Uh, also... Uh, uh, they have no particular desire to dominate us or something like that. Uh, we are nice experimental uh, uh, species, as it were. Not much huh. more than that. That's uh, my impression. And the other is, um, do you have any better understanding, because of all this, of, of our creator or a god? I have a very much that. Uh, uh, one of the things that I had it all the time and didn't realize it. That is that uh, this uh, this Earth life system uh, is a a created process and a creative process. And uh, I can, as an engineer, go look at the leaf on a tree and see the design of it and what it's aimed to do. And that is, it's, an, uh, it's a transducer, as it were. And it can stand all sorts of winds and everything else, and when it's true for the year, it drops off. That's really a very scientific, creative thing from my point of view, but it is creative. Yes. And then uh, uh, in working on this further, one of the things that was so utterly fascinating to me that there are portions of this uh, Focus 27 beyond, uh, this is beyond time and space, believe me, it's the last vestige of of human, active human thought. But there, there, I was astounded to discover that there is some type of energy field there that lets the human, the human mind, be a creator and, mm. and create carbon life. I was astounded to discover that. Moreover, uh, one of my, part of my contract, I guess it was, for the help that I have received is the idea that Going into, uh, going back and looking at the source of this creative process, and I got as far as uh, uh, what is I called the emitter, for lack of making a common term, and the creator or creative process is behind that, and there is an aperture to which one can go, but not until they're complete, as the, the people waiting or people, not quite the word, the beings waiting to go through there massive things, uh, they pass some of this information along to me. And, yes, that's one of the things that, in turn, has certainly come very much to my knowing, and that is that uh, I know, as I sit here, how our civilization uh, is restrained in terms of anything that's non-physical. We don't know anything about it in any way, shape, or form. And the options that are available to us I have to, we are no longer physical here. Uh, instead of being, one of them, of course, is being the human addict and go back and live another life because you get addicted to being human. But there are so many other opportunities or options along that spectrum of energy. And one of them is to go and, <laughs> I'll put it in the crude way, I try to make it in things, ways that we can understand it of now. Course. And that is to, shake the hand of the creator and say, well, this is a great job. Not prostrate and, and, and adoration, but just to say, you're a real smart one. <laughs> All right. Wow. All right.
right, Mr. Monroe, let's go to the phones. Every one of them's locked up and wants to talk to you. All so, right, go ahead. Uh, let's do it. On on the wild card line, you're on the air with Robert Monroe. Good uh, good evening. Hello there. This is Fritz calling. When Shirley MacLaine's five-hour television special, Out on the Limb, was aired way back in January of 87, some of her highlights was astral projection. It did make a lot of waves. Of course, her book with the same title did make the radio and television interview circuit years before that, and many, many millions of people were exposed to the OOB subject. Now, Robert, we need another catalyst to push that subject to the people's attention. After all, they could join the Cosmic College for free. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> Uh, well, uh, uh, we uh, we are we have not made a big point of being widely known yet. Uh, uh, we did a, a slight study to indicate how many people users have been used in the methods that we have we have available and put forth out of demand, but not out of advertising. And uh, we figure that there have been. Uh, a little over two and a half million users of these various types of uh, exercises on tape that we that we put throughout through the years, and uh, these are a means of beginning to do the very things that you're talking about. Um, Mr. Monroe, I recall uh, he mentioned Shirley MacLaine. Yeah. And I, oh, another thing that reminds me, I, I got very amused uh, that uh, in uh, Shirley's. Uh, movie uh, in her picture uh, I think she was the one that went into a uh, bookstore looking for uh, uh, something and and right in front of her eyes was my book Far Journeys I think it was yes it was very funny and I thought huh <laughs> um, she uh, uh, alluded to the possibility or, or uh, claimed that she had traveled toward the moon um, away from the earth uh, Mr. Monroe um, there are limitations uh, that we believe we face physically with travel to other planetary systems uh, with regard to the speed of light and all the rest of it. I, I'm sure you're well aware of that. Um, might out-of-body experiences be a way ultimately to travel uh, where otherwise we may never go? Absolutely. We, we did a great deal of that in the mid-70s. In the mid um, uh, uh, and these were engineers and physicists principally. And, uh, oh, we saw all the stuff on the moon before uh, our uh, shuttles and stuff got there. Uh, we went, to, went out to, uh, to Mars and out beyond that. It, the trouble is we found that uh, we got nervous about going beyond the solar system, knowing how we might get back, we might get lost, until we found out it was very simple. All we had to do is to think back to our physical body, even though we may be a uh, hundred light years away, and we'd have no problem at all getting back. You didn't even know, and you say, "Well, where have you been?" Out there, <laughs> we could say. Where Out we there. Been. Well, maybe NASA should be talking to the Monroe Institute. On well, the... we've had some NASA people through. Oh, you have. Oh, right. yeah. On the wild card line, you're on the air with Robert Monroe. Hello. Hello, uh, Mr. Bell. This is Tom out of Seattle. Yes, sir. Oh my God! I finally got through. Uh, this is incredible. Uh, uh, I've had out of body experiences. I think starting back when I was about 13. Yeah. They were nightmares and things like that. Yeah. And uh, as I progressed through my life, I remember about 17 got more severe, and then uh, got away from home. And then in my late 20s, it got extremely severe. And you know, I, I didn't know they arrived by experience that there were nightmares and something, you know, freaky. And then all of a sudden, I started having control over it and kind of enjoying it. Good for you. Good for and you. And then all of a sudden, just like you were just saying earlier about that uh, actress. I walked into a bookstore, and lo and behold, I'd never been there before. I didn't know what I went in there for. There was your book in front of my eyes. Uh huh. very good. And, and I started studying it, and I started practicing it. Good for you. And I never felt so good spiritually or physically after I'd go out of my body and then come back. And then I started, over a period of time, losing the power. I don't know what I was doing wrong. I just felt there was, I don't know, it's, it's kind of hard to explain. There's something very weird. Uh, I was experimenting with it. I actually did two experiments, unscientifically, of course, on, yes. as a truck driver, that proved it to other people that I actually got out of my body, went by them and did things and could see things while I was supposedly asleep, which I wasn't. No, <laughs> you know well, what I'm I talking about. I can tell you one that I had to do out of desperation to be sure somebody understood it years and years ago. 
uh, I went and I uh, pinched this woman in her side. Huh? <laughs> it left a bruise. Oh, my. <laughs> oh, my. And, uh, and so then there are, it is possible to have physical manifestations uh, during an out-of-body experience. Uh, it, uh, what I was doing, I uh, discovered years later, was that I was not pinching her physical body. I was p pinching this other body. Oh. You see, and that's what left the bruise on the physical. But it was so uh, uh, it was so astonishing because I didn't think I pinched her that hard at all. It was on it was on uh, uh, right just above her around her waist, up above her hip. <laughs> uh huh. Very discreet of you, sir. Yes, it was discreet. <laughs> all right. On the uh, wild card line, you're on the air with Robert Monroe. Hello. Hi, hello. Hey, John, uh, let me turn down my radio. Thank you. So remember to do that, everybody, right away, please. We have a delay system. Okay. Here. Um. Uh. I have a question for Robert Monroe. Yes. Um. I read his book, uh, both of his books, in fact. Uh, I read Journeys Out of the Body and also Far Journeys. And uh, Mr. Monroe, um, I, I have a question for you. Um, in your book, uh, Journeys Out of the Body, uh, you talk about this one incident where you go to, you have the intent of visiting this one person at this house. You give his initials as E.W. Yeah, mm hmm and uh you uh in before you do this you end up uh, going to this uh, garage and um after that you wonder why you ended up there instead of visiting this one person and later you visit this area and you find out that uh there were these power primaries yes, near yes. Mm -hmm. near the garage well the thing is that go ahead and um Suppose and and you said they had a fairly high voltage. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then uh, and then in the book you say, um, do electric fields attract the second body? And uh, is this the medium through which it travels? And I thought that was kind of interesting. Well, yes, I've uh, just learned, of course, that it's not electromagnetic. That's for sure. <laughs> it, 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 it we we we've become very acutely aware of an energy field that our science knows nothing about because of the simple reason they can't measure it. And uh, uh, and the, you are using this right now. In other words, we uh, uh, Skip was talking about brainwave patterns, but these are generated by this other energy field, and they're the effect, and the causative factor is this other energy field. And there is no relationship to the electromagnetic no, energy? No, not as such. Uh -huh. All right. We uh tested that very thoroughly. On the wild card line, you're on the air with Robert Monroe. Hello. Yes, good evening. This is uh, Brian from KLPE country down here in Medford. Yes, Brian, you have a question? Yes, I'm just curious if uh, he answered one of them partially. I had two of them, then you were talking about documented proof of this experience happening. And so if you have someone pinching a woman, but has there been scientific studies done with that that they have documented? And second, if you're out there somewhere and something happens to your physical body, what happens to you out there then? Mm -hmm. Well, it depends on how, how much it happens. One of the things that gets you back to your physical body, and uh, you, you're out having a wonderful time doing all these things, and you get an urge, a signal to come back. And uh, uh, you, uh, as in the early times, you've been concerned, oh, something's going wrong, the building's on fire where my body is, and all this kind of thing. And you know what the most common thing that pulls you back? Is the fact that your bladder is full. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that'll pull you back and motivate you all the time. He also asked about documentation of physical effects. Uh, we have those. We don't make a, um, uh, a consistent practice of it, but they occur quite naturally in what we do. And we have quite a, a long line of them in terms of that. But you see, again, we're dealing with an energy that cannot be measured scientifically, so you can only measure the effects of the energy. You understand the difference? Yes, sir. All and right. That's the problem. All right. Wild card line, you're on the air with Robert Monroe. Hello. Hello, Mr. Bell. Hello, Mr. Monroe. Hello. Um, you know, I think you'd probably use, if, if I said this in the past, you'd probably think I was nuts. But No, I wouldn't. <laughs> um, I've had several, um, quite a few experiences with astral projection, and in which case other people actually experienced my being there. They didn't know it was me, and I never told them in advance that I was going to do what I did. Very good. As long as you did not tell them in, in advance, that's a very important key. Okay, but now uh, that's it was it was incredible when I found out later, um, and another friend that I had told that I did this was on the phone with us. Um, the three of us were on the phone, and 
and it came, it sort of unfolded. But what I wanted to ask you, um, and Art had Richard Hoagland on, and I asked him when he was on about the, the Viking lander on Mars and how uh, specific questions about the arm that was was supposedly jammed. Yes. Yeah, and I actually had the experience that I went in 1978 to Mars mm -hmm. and un, and found that the the jam the arm was jammed and that I unjammed it. Hey, that's very good. But I I haven't to this day, and it seemed like Richard Hoagland didn't um, uh, came up with a very logical explanation of what happened, and he explained it over the air. So it may have just been my imagination. Mm -hmm. But I have very real experiences with it. Very and, good. And um, it was an incredible experience. Well, well I can sure. tell you the most common uh, illustration of of this other energy field of which we have a part and we manipulate a part, but we don't know we're doing it. And that is that uh, you will maybe of an evening say, well, I ought to call Bill tonight. And uh, five minutes after you think it's of that, the phone rings and says, oh, no, this is Bill. <laughs> well, I thought I'd just give you a ring. And how many thousand times a day that happens in the human, uh, uh, this human civilization? Well, is that, is that precognition, or did you cause Bill to call you? You caused him to call. You were thinking on his, on his, on, in his energy field, and you imprinted him. And uh, I must have had that happen, oh, at least 500 times in the last... <laughs> 50 years. And in the last 50 years, how frequently have you sat down and wondered about the ethics of that? Well, that's a good question, isn't it? I think and so. And the other part of that question that you read, say, well, uh, uh, that's one of the things you see that's omitted within our culture and our civilization. And it's done a lot, lot more than we consciously think. Makes one wonder uh, how much action is really... Uh... Oh, willful. On, on, on the toll-free line, you're on the air with Robert Monroe. Where are you calling from, please? This is Dave in Spokane, Art. Yes, hi, Dave. Again, well, I said when we were talking with Mr. Hoagland that my expertise wasn't in that area. It was more in this area, and here we are. Uh, it's good to know that you're not alone. <laughs> yeah, it's good it to know that I'm not a kook because I've been doing this. I'm 50, and I've been doing this since I was about five. Yeah. And an, the entire gamut of uh, I've probably got a million things I could say to you. Uh, well, what I would like you to do if you've gone that far, or anyone else going that far, by all means, drop us a note. We would like to, we would indeed like to hear about it. Well, and, I certainly would. And uh, we would certainly appreciate it. And, and uh, uh, right, uh, right to the, to uh, our uh, our uh, staff psychologist, uh, Darlene Miller, and. Uh, uh, all you have to do is it's Route 1, Box 175, Faber, Virginia, 22938. Route 1, Box 175, Faber, F-A-B is in boy, E-R, Virginia, 22938. F-A-B-E-R? Faber, yeah. I, I would say Faber. It's Faber, yeah, but they like it. in Virginia they call it Faber. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I have one question for you. Yeah. Very, very quickly. Very yeah. quickly, have you ever been to a place where it was totally dark? All right, and on, on, hold that answer, uh, Mr. Monroe, and we'll be right back with you. This is Dreamland on the CBC Radio Network, half hour mark. My guest is Robert Monroe. There's more. Back in the 70s, of, uh, that was the equivalent of that type of reading, and, with, uh, and it was electromagnetic, but we do not, uh, we do not, uh, perceive the aura as such, but you can perceive, believe me, you can perceive other energies of, of people, but it doesn't come out as an aura, it comes out as a radiation, and you can't see it, you feel it. Mm -hmm. All right, sir. Uh, on the toll-free line, you're on the air with Robert Monroe. Good evening. Hi, how are you doing, Art? Fine. Where are you, sir? Santa Barbara, California. Santa Barbara. I had an experience a couple of years ago where I was sitting outside in the morning about 4 o'clock, <clears throat> wide awake, and I started going up through space out into space, past the moon. It was extremely exhilarating. Yes, it is, isn't it? Being totally free, just floating. I went out to a, to a point where I, I could recognize all the stars and the constellations, and I got to the point where I couldn't recognize anything. I looked back, and I couldn't see our sun anymore. Mm -hmm. I kept going to a point, and then I really started getting frightened then. Yes, I, I know. Was, we got into that, and when, uh, uh, that's why I say we finally figured out how to cure that 
fear of being not where you knowing where you are. Right. I finally got to came to a planet, and I was coming down to the surface of a planet, and there were hundreds of people in my mind, you know, looking at different knowledge that I had, anything that I knew, just you know, having conversations. And I came down to a particular place on the planet, and a, an old man came out, and he essentially came into my mind, told all the other people to leave. And I asked him where I was, and I said that he told me where I was, you know, on this planet where humans live. And I asked him, why was I there, and how did I get there? And he said, well, you're from a penal colony, and I'll send you back. <laughs> I said, because I don't know how to get back. And so he sent me back. Yeah. And this took all about 15 minutes. Oh. That... But, it, but it was I was wide awake. When I got back, I was just shaking, and my whole body was shaking I, and cold I can, sweat. I can appreciate that. Uh, you see, that, that's the thing. I went through some very many different phases of that type of thing. That That's why uh, being uh, very much too left brain, perhaps, uh, <laughs> I in turn have to get these into a form where we say, well, first uh, experience it, and then after that get your left brain in to analyze it and control it. Uh, Mr. Monroe, uh, again referring for a second to the uh, near-death experience, there are so many parallels. Yeah. Uh, there are a number of doctors now who say that the classic vision that people have, that is of a very bright light mm -hmm. uh, with surrounding darkness, yeah. is merely a product of the dying synapses of the brain, that the synapses will die from the out moving inward, and that, that that's what that white light is that's uh that's as good a definition as any uh, uh what we call uh, focus 22 is that is that tunnel is that tunnel yes and uh, uh uh this is how we commonly identify it i see incidentally speaking of of, of this one uh, time time thing i'm I, I enjoy so much the name of your series your program called dreamland <laughs> Yes, sir. So we better change it a little bit. Maybe I can help you change it. I add some, <laughs> with some nice wild stuff. But one, I wanted to let you know because it relates to what, a little bit what we're talking about. Uh, we have a new series for use in residences and in hospitals and hospices called Going Home. And it is designed for a person with a, till, a terminal illness or injury. And we just put that out within the last two months. And what it is, it's designed to help not only that terminal subject decide what to go, where to go after he or she dies, and what to do by giving them a guided tour, as it were, and then giving them the option uh, to do whatever they want to do. Most importantly, uh, that's half of this series. The other half of that series, the series, is for the support group, the family, friends, and loved ones, and the caregivers. Sure. So that... They need the help to understand this too, and it's it's uh, got the support of psychologists and, and caregivers all over the United States and Europe. Would you say that somebody who knows uh, roughly uh, that they are going to die, that they are going to pass on, uh, is a fortunate person? Uh, would 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 that be a fortunate person, or would it be better not to know? Oh, I I I I'm very much believe in in the. Uh, I believe it's not enough. It, I should put it in a no category. Uh, that we should have a choice in dying. Absolutely. I, I think that the individual, when uh, because we so many, we have discovered them already, and through the research that we did for this new thing. Uh, and that is that many, many people have a death wish, and it's not. Uh, it's uh, you. You can't stop that death wish. They'll get a stroke, and then they'll get cancer, or whatever it is. And that reason for that can't be detected, because uh, once you meet them after they've got the process underway, and they don't know this until you, they, uh, some do, but they don't really consciously know it. Uh -huh. It's because they've completed what they came to do. Yeah. And having completed it, there's no sense in hanging around. And it's that simple. I had a very dear friend uh, uh, who did exactly that, and uh, no one knew why he would he would have a stroke, and then uh, after that was, was taken care of pretty well. Then he then developed uh, abdominal cancer, 
until I met him after he did. I didn't see any reason why, but he had done what he had done. He was he was uh, ready. He was ready, and there's no sense in hanging around. Everything is his grandchildren are all fine. They, everything's in good shape and whatever. And he completed what he wanted to do, and so he just simply died. You can't stop a person that in that case, don't you see? Yes, sir, you, I do. You can put him on life support or whatever, and you can keep his body uh, working, but he's gone. <laughs> All right. On the toll-free line, you're on the air with Robert Monroe. Hello. Hi there. Hi. Where are you, sir? I'm from Phoenix. Phoenix. This is Henry. Hi, Henry. Uh, I, this is fantastic. I wanted to ask a question about the the vibration uh, you felt, sir, originally. Was, is that a, like an inner electrical, like a finer electrical feeling than you would get from uh, from household current? Is yeah, it's it, like it, that and quite uh, exhilarating. Yeah, uh, it did that. It. it it uh, felt that way to me initially, and I had since, long since discovered that, uh, that it was not electrical at all, uh, because uh, I even had a test at that time to see what it was, and it was not even showing as a, uh, a mechanical vibration, neither that nor an electrical one. So what else was it? You see, our science could not measure it. So, Mr. Monroe, you would tell people, do not fear death? Absolutely. I think that's the point, is that... Uh, it's a, a terrible thing to, to fear it that much, because when you're ready, and uh, and it may well be that uh, you, that's what we do with our going home. We help people uh, become aware of the opportunities that have exist beyond physical death. Mr. Monroe, will we ever come to a full understanding uh, of the process of life and process of death? Will we? Are we ever meant to know? Do you think? Absolutely. The point is, you see, you, you are growing a new personality, and there is this discriminated circuit that holds all this back till your personality, uh, your intellect, uh, your intelligence self develops. And once that develops, then fine, it's all open and it's absurdly easy. <laughs> That's what your dreamland is, don't you see? <laughs> yes, sir, I do. And uh, uh, Mr. Monroe, we're, we're out of time. I want to give your phone number. I know there's a million people. The lines are still clogged. They have questions. Uh, it's area code 804-361-1252. Yes, and they can call that during the day tomorrow also. Okay. Uh, or all during the week as far as that's concerned. One more time, sir. Give us your address, please. Is, uh, and I'll make it real simple. The Monroe Institute, Faber, Virginia. Yes. Like uh, like the pencil, you know, F A B E R Virginia two two nine three eight. Sir, two uh, two nine three eight uh, uh, nine seven four nine. All right, sir. That's it all. has been a pleasure having you on the program. I would love to do it again sometime. We're just out of time, and I've got to go. It did get going, didn't it? Oh, it did get going, didn't it, <laughs> Mr. Monroe? Thank you. My pleasure. Take care. Robert Monroe of the Monroe Institute to order copies of this program or any other Dreamland program. Area code 503-664-7966. It has been a pleasure. Thank you all and good night. Welcome to Dreamland, a program dedicated to an examination of areas in the human experience not easily nor neatly put in a box. Things seen at the edge of vision, awakening a part of the mind as yet not mapped, and yet things every bit as real as the air we breathe but don't see. This is Dreamland. Good evening, everybody. This should be quite the program. 
As promised, we will have Robert Monroe of the Monroe Institute here. What an honor that is. Dr. Monroe, actually Robert Monroe, just Robert Monroe, coming up next, uh, he'll tell us about the Monroe Institute. Have you ever wondered about travel? Uh, not the type you take on a domestic airline, but the type you might take from your own body. Robert Monroe did. He'll tell you about it coming up. You're listening to Dreamland on the CBC Radio Network. I'm Art Bell. Well, good evening, everybody. The Monroe Institute travels from the body. The Monroe Institute was founded by Robert Monroe, a former broadcasting executive who began to undergo spontaneous experiences in 1958 that drastically altered his life. Unpredictably and without willing it, Mr. Monroe found himself leaving his physical body via a second 